What's up, everybody? It's Jason Cruz here uh, once again with the interview. And this time, we're going to be talking to Uncle Lukey. Luke Cattell has a new book. There it is. There it is. Hold it up. Has a new book, Inside the Ropes of Boxing. Uh, it's a very interesting, uh, practical, uh, fun read. It's on Amazon, and it's uh, it's uh, affordably priced. So buy it, you cheapskates! For God's sakes, you can't get everything free. Uh, Uncle Lukey, how you, Lukey, how you doing? Yeah, Uncle Lukey is here. I I don't mind being called Uncle Lukey. That's like what every kid across the nation when they see me in a boxing gym. I'm Uncle Lukey. Hey, Uncle Lukey, can you give me ten dollars to buy lunch? Um, thank you, man. I appreciate the kind words. Love sitting down here, having a cup of coffee, both figurative and literally, um, with you while we talk. Excellent. So let's talk about the book. Uh, I know I actually saw you write out on social media last spring that you're going to write a book, and I didn't think that the book would come out so quickly. So tell me about, uh, first of all, why you wanted to write it, and then how, how uh, you kind of formed the whole thing. Okay, so it's twofold. Uh, Frank Steya encouraged me to write two books. Um, he said I should write two books. And I wrote, sat down and wrote 70 pages. It took The book took about five days, which probably if you look at it, it's like big words. It's not really like the most elegant. It's not some James Joyce book. But it, I guess I had a story to tell. I'm kind of rambling here, but I'm trying to give you a different oh, answer than some of the other ones. So I'm trying to, give, trying to give you a little different angle to it is that I guess I really had a lot of this stuff held within from some of my years in boxing. And then my friend Mike Lee... Um, who's a podcaster and a fitness instructor, he was like, you really need to write a book because that would separate you. And that's how you go to the hall of fame. And I don't care about a hall. Of you know me well enough to, I don't care about all this stuff. Like, but what did excite me was that potentially I could help a young person because I think boxing MMA has an exploitive nature. We both love it. It's very transformative as working professionals. We're both obsessed with this sport. And there's something about it that brings people from all all aspects of wealth. Like you can be in, in the room with a doctor and someone who's in Section 8 housing in the same facility. And there's something wonderful about that, about boxing, where it brings all these different groups of people who might not be around each other outside of maybe like a supermarket. And I wanted to get more information in the hands of young people who really are passionate about this sport and want to kind of take it to the so, you know, I, I really uh, thought that was a really good uh, book. It, it seemed to me like, uh, especially like you you said, it, it spoke to a uh, young fighter or somebody who wants to get into the business. Uh, I thought it was interesting that you put questions at the end of some chapters. Uh, was that something that you you meant to do? Was it, it kind of, or was it coming out as far as when you started to write it that like these are things that whoever is reading it, I want them to kind of, focus on uh when they uh after they complete the chapter do you want me to get fake deep can i get fake sure, deep? sure sure okay let's get fake deep so one of my favorite um book series this is going to show that i actually read books which is going to be embarrassing right um is caro's i think it's four books on lyndon b johnson who i think is one of the more interesting presidents no matter what your political stance is i think lbj is an interesting president to look at because there's so many aspects of him where he was kind of a machiavellian president and obviously niccolo machiavelli's uh the prince was is a big inspiration in my life and i think that's kind of ironic because this book in many ways is a treatise and it's kind of written in the way uh machiavelli wrote the prince in the sense of like this is what i think to get back to the question, I say all that stuff to say, when I read Caro's book on Lyndon B. Johnson, I personally wanted there to be questions at the end. I wanted to reflect after thinking through everything I had learned. So obviously I wasn't, I'm not some uh, elegant, long writer in this book. My book went from 200 pages to 117 pages, thanks to my girlfriend, because she was like, dude, no one's going to read it if it's hardcore boxing people. This is probably going to be like one of five books outside of public schools they'll ever read. You cannot have a long book. It has to have big font, all that type of stuff. So then I reflected back on the Caro book and I wished that there was questions. So a big takeaway was twofold. If people are intimidated by reading, maybe they could start with the questions at the end of the chapter and then 
work their way through the chapter if they want to. So like if they're intimidated by reading, maybe they struggle with reading, go to the questions first and just think about it and formulate your own opinions without knowing anything. Two, I don't want this book to be me preaching. This is not the 48 laws of power of this is what you have to do. No, this is your own life. This is what I deem to be true. I don't know if it is truth, but this is what I deem to be true. These are the laws I function with under. So that being said, I'd like you to reflect upon them, but also come to your own decisions because I think every individual is unique and has to create their own unique outcomes. That is pretty damn deep. I'll be honest. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. That 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 that's that's well well said. Uh, and as far as the uh, and this kind of goes uh, with your your answer there. As far as the audience, the target audience that you wanted to reach, it seems like it's a lot a lot toward younger fighters. The the chapters that you write, um, you know, why why don't you kind of gloss over some of the chapters? But like, as far as uh, the uh, the uh, uh, composition of the book, how you how you decided what you wanted to keep in, what you what you got out when you 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 edited it down, what was in that process? I mean, it that process was very painful, and I wasn't very involved. It was my girlfriend just basically going, "This is not good." This is not good. You're saying you're basically saying things two times over, but you're using different words. It was like, how can we say as much as possible and as little as possible? Because this is not meant to be uh, Dostoevsky's crime and punishment. This is not meant to function as a television, as entertainment. This is meant to be consumed in a few hours. Or if someone has a, a lower level reading comprehension, that they could work on it for two to three weeks. And this could be something, I guess it, I, my intention was first to write a book. It wasn't to do any of this, the noble thing. No, none of that. It was to write a book second fold. Then it became, how can this be a second opinion for a fighter? So if they're in a time of crisis and it's their dad and they're talking to someone else, how could this book function as another form of an opinion to help guide them through their career. I'm not saying it will, but that became the point for the editorial process of how can this be best consumed for someone who might not be reading all that much? That was the target focus, because I think that this book is more for the boxers. My next book, which will probably be my last boxing book, is going to be outside um, outside the ropes of boxing. That's going to be more stories from traveling and stuff that might be a little bit longer, although I might not be capable of longer. That's going to be more for people that like to read quote unquote, or people that want story time. That's going to be like, I like campfire stories. I like, I like scary stories. That's going to be more in that genre. This was really written in my opinion to outline kind of what I deem to be true. Um, I know you're a big football guy, mm -hmm. Bill Belichick. He gives players a football handbook like you don't know the rules if you go to play with the patriots this is a ball this is that i mean i worked from that concept unknowingly and then i worked back so i wrote everything that i wanted to write for a boxing book and then i worked backwards thinking on what are the golden standards and then i really worked from niccolo machiavelli and it was like i really wanted it to be the exact length of the prince but then we we as a team cut down and condensed it's also, I mean, because you the book goes from the basics. Which here are the things you need to be be a boxer. Here are the gyms you need to go to, and then you you touch upon coaches, you touch upon parents, you talk about uh, your you know, the amateurs, and then you go to the pros, all of that stuff. I think it was, I think it was well done. Uh, as far as the production, the logistic process, how did you go about getting it done? How did you get the, uh, just, uh, you you had uh, somebody do the, the cover. How did you get it all done and get it on Amazon and all that? Well, that's the hard part, right? Because I paid everybody. Yeah. So like when you pay everybody, it's always hard because it's like, I, I want my name to be standing along good business. So it's like I hired an editor. So I got an editor. That's X amount of dollars. Then I got my girlfriend looking over it. Then my mom read it after my girlfriend. Everyone, when, when what I learned from editing is the more editors you get, the more your words change because everyone sees something they don't like. And I just had to learn that firsthand. So that was about a month and a half process. 
and then I'm writing in stuff. So then people will change it and then I'll rewrite. And then Cronk Art is um, my good friend who's done some artwork for me, did the podcast poster. I love his um, his illustrations. And when people always say, don't judge a book by a cover, doesn't that don't people say in the negative what they really think? So if people say, don't judge a book by a cover, they're going to judge your book by a cover. So I wanted him to kind of have freedom to create something he really liked and uh, an image he liked. And that was simply that. And I kept telling him, hey, man, where do I pay you? And he wanted it to be exactly perfect. And that's why I sent over a couple of books to him in France, you know, uh, because he did such a wonderful job. And yeah, I mean, that's the cover again. Show the cover again. So here's the cover. How did you decide that to be the cover? Or did he just take a, did he uh, kind of uh, figure that out uh, for you? Good question. I like that. No one's asked that. So I sent him two images. One image is what's the back cover image. So let me pull it up for you. Show and tell. So this image, I okay. sent him me at King's Gym in Oakland, Andre Ward's. I think it's his second gym technically, but it's thought of as Andre Ward's gym. And then I went to the Santa Fe, New Mexico opera. I was in Santa Fe and I tried to get on uh, Paco Ridge. I bought a flag and some gear it actually cost $200 for like not that much stuff. Not very excited about that. But I went to the Santa Fe opera and then that was a photo of me wearing um, a shirt at the Santa Fe opera. And I said, well, here's a photo I took tonight at the Santa Fe opera. Here's me in a boxing gym. Run with it. The other illustration he did i think is going to be the premise for the next book so i think the the hoodie cover that no one's seen that's going to be the premise for and i've kind of got a vision but i basically i know when you give people freedom artistically and if you like what they do chances are it's going to be better sometimes i micromanage but for this one i just told him i like your work i trust you i know you're a professional maybe we'll change up a little bit but he came up with this idea with this image and I absolutely loved it. And you know what I love about it? I grew up watching PBS cartoons. This really feels like to me something that like when I pass away, there could be an animation of me looking like that. And then I start talking about boxing. That's where my mind first went. And I'm like, okay, that looks very iconic. So I, I liked it. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm very pleased with the product. Well, that's that's awesome because I, um, my cover uh, for my book was just done with stock photos, which was I wasn't a big fan. I just it was happy it got out, but I really I liked the, liked the cover of the book. So let's talk about the next book. Uh, well, no, before we leave the next uh, to talk about the next book, let's talk about uh, the reception it got. Uh, did you now was uh, the marketing process? Uh, did you send it out to friends? Have have the younger boxing prospects have they had had it in their hands? Have you been told how uh, what they thought about it? I mean, it's it's gotten a warm reception, like people have bought it, people have shared it. I haven't really gotten much like reviews on it, to be honest. Like I've heard a lot of people be like, that's useful and stuff. But I don't really think it's a book that people are going to form a ton of opinions on. It's kind of like the way I look at it is it's like you get like a new LG TV and then you read the manual. Well, how do you really review the manual? You know, it's like it's not. You know, I think it's more so people appreciate the thought that went into it. And then I hope, my hope is, it's probably going to be largely forgotten for a year or two, but maybe it gets in the hand of a young fighter who goes on to do something in this sport. And this is something that was pivotal in their life. And that I think that sometimes when you do things from a purity, that it has a longer shelf life that you you believe so my goal is to get it around the right people so this can be a moment in their life at a young point in their life where it's a pivotal piece of art or information and maybe that that can be a part of someone's story moving forward nice now let's talk about outside the outside the ring the apparently the sequel have you started writing it i mean i was gonna do it and drop it for black friday oh really um I was thinking about doing that because I mean, I feel like when I sit down and write, I can really pump through a lot because it's like, I can probably, if I just lock myself in my office, 
I can pretty much write about 50 or 60 pages a day. That's like crazy. if I, so like if I sit and focus, I can pretty much do that. So it's like, I, I'm working on the structure of it. I've got a couple of narrative stories I want to write, but I just with how much time goes into marketing the book, it's so much more to do it right and to get it out there. I just don't think that the time is right to do that. So, I mean, it could be as soon as the maybe next July or it could be next year for my birthday again, which is in October, just a few days ago. I really thought that would have been cool to hit double, go back to back real quick and been mm -hmm. like that. I mean, I still might, you know, if like, because it's the thing about outside the ropes of boxing is I have so many boxing stories. Like um, I was thinking about like a great, there's a bunch of stories. I just got to get the people too. like a guy like Rick Morigian has a lot to say, but not many people have the courage to talk to Rick because he's so busy. I'd like to pay for a lunch for Rick and sit down with him for 30 minutes or go back to archival interviews and let's get some of the stories. Like, I don't know if you know, but Rick, uh, when he was in college, took took all of his grant money to throw a party at the college and he thought he went broke, but the game went into overtime and then the people came to the party. I'd like to really unpack that story into a deeper <laughs> story, right? Because it's yeah. like it's interesting. A lot of these people in boxing or MMA, there's a lot of interesting aspects that lead to the character they present themselves mm -hmm. that now is here I am professional guy. And a lot of boxing's like showmanship and that. For me, a story I like I'll give you, like obviously one of the key stories is when I almost got murdered going to interview Edgar Berlanga. That's gonna be like one of the big ones. Well, I now you get, just left us hanging. <laughs> I mean, I've said this story a lot. Like it's like a guy road raged on me. It was like a young kid. And uh. I'll give you the quick one. Um he thought that um I was making fun of him, right? In traffic. I hit my brakes, but I, I'm a bad driver. I drive like an old person, so I hit my brakes. And um, I'm I'm talking to my this guy who does podcasts, Richard Ortiz from Fresno, California. I'm talking to him. I think I'm doing a show with him, actually. We'd, I'll have to talk to Richard and see. And I go like this. And I think the youngster thought I'm all brake checking him and rah, rah, rah. So the kid drives back by me. He has a messed up car, no license plates. I'm in San Mateo, by the way, which is a very wealthy, affluent yeah. community. The kid has an RIP lanyard, no shirt on. The, <laughs> His car looks like it's frowning, if that makes sense to the viewer. Right. It just looks like a car. He just looks like life is hard. He pulls to the side of the road, and I go, oh, my God. So I'm trying to get over. I'm going this way, mm -hmm. and I'm trying to get this way so I cannot go by him. He pulled to the shoulder of the road, and uh, I went around a couple of cars. Do, do, do. This kid came around like a great white shark. He came like a boomerang. Like he did like um action movie type turns. So he's going left lane, right lane. And he's like magically not getting in a car rack. It was the craziest thing to see out of my peripheral vision. So he's like, roo, roo, roo. So he comes and um, not to tell on the kid, but he showed, he showed a weapon at me. He kind of held it and he was yelling. And um, hopefully I didn't freeze there. And I think I think the kid got scared, thankfully, and he went in front of me and it was traffic jam. And I just went off on the first exit and I'm going to film Berlanga. So I'm going out to film an interview at Berlanga it's at this gym. So I go, I park in a residential area three blocks over from the street I got off on, lay in my back seat for 10 minutes. And then I go to the gym, uh, park my car, go in, tell Berlanga like I'm like, dude, I almost got killed. Then he goes, tell my dad. So I have to tell his dad. And then I have to tell everybody. And everyone doesn't quite believe me. And I'm like, what the hell? And then I shoot it and I'm nervous. But then once I get over to my side, I'm fine. And then it was like about three or four weeks where like I'd see someone. I'm like, is that the guy looking for me? And I'm like, oh, it's just post-traumatic stress. So that's one. I think a better story that um, I haven't shared was like I used to go to these Rick Marie Ian shows in Tachi Palace where they used to have um Palace, yeah. I think Ian McCall me and McCall Uncle Creepy mm -hmm. was like Uncle a Creepy. staple of fighting there like in the back in the day that's right so yeah. if you go out there you're going real like you take a freeway and then you go to the middle of nowhere Tulare is like literally you take a freeway and then you take a freeway that's not even a freeway it's just a road to nowhere like the talking head song so I go out there and 
I remember I'd stop at these rest stops because I, I I'm a guy, I don't know about you fight nights over. I'm leaving at nine o'clock. I lived about three and a half hours away. I want to end at well, I want to get home at 1231 because mentally I like to have a full day because I really like to get stuff done every day. I hate devoting another day to travel. Like that's one of my least things I'd like to wake up at 4 a.m. But see, I don't like the 4 a.m. travel. This is yeah. probably going to be in the book, my philosophy on this, because now you've got a whole day, but you're you're groggy. Yeah. I like, if possible, to get back, sleep, and now you're starting with a refreshed day. So I remember one time, I, I can't recall what town it was, but if I go by this rest stop, I'll always remember. Um, I go in and it's like there there's no clerk or anything, but the door is open. And I go into the rest area and it was like literally like a horror film. It's got the white flashing light and it's fluorescent lights i swear to god someone came into this rest stop while i'm in there i'm taking one of those big uncle lukey pee pees and poo poos i'm letting off a breakfast burrito someone goes into the stall next to me not a big deal starts tapping on the stall so i'm like and i'm in mid i'm in mid bathroom so i'm like what the hell are you doing and they're just like not saying anything so that was that was a bad one. I had my, on that on that same excursion. I've had my trunk broke break, so I pulled on my trunk too hard and the latch broke. So I was two hours out and I had to buy all the bungee cables. I'm crying with my friend Hector Ruiz, and I jerry rigged something. AAA wouldn't come to help. So these are the type of stories in the next book. Unbelievable. Well, I mean, it definitely sounds like Tales from the Road. Uh, it's uh, interesting thing. I, I I really do like the. Uh, <laughs> the narratives and the, and the stories that that would sa- that sounds pretty cool. So, uh, is it still to be to be determined for that for that book? I mean, I just gotta write it. Yeah, you know, I don't but know. That's I the mean, hard part, though, right? Not really. Like, I mean, really? I just gotta sit down and like structure it because there's like a lot of so like with that book, like it's like I want to give a little bit of my origin story. So if anyone ever cares. I'm not going to give the full picture, but I'll give a little bit more to kind of how I got into boxing, how Bernard Hopkins, Chad Dawson was such a big moment in my life. That fight that basically meant nothing to a lot of people. But um, beyond that, it's like there's so many fighters that meant a lot to me, like Ricardo Pinnell, like Kareem Mayfield. And the world doesn't remember them that well. So I'd like to go back get some of their stories from their personal experience and then just remember them the way they were for me coming up in boxing, like archive them in the history of my region. Like, I just think that we do a bad job as a sport, not preserving people that laid the found foundation as opposed to other sports. So this sport is also going to be a tribute to my region along with stories on the road. And I, my original idea for this book was to create narrative stories for each chapter of this book, Inside the Ropes. So just narrative things with guys like Bruno Escalante and all that. But I think it's going to also get like this interview. It's going to go off side, side streets. So we're going to start on one thing and then, oh, I'm going to remember something go this way. But I mean, I, I'd like to also give um, a fitting tribute to Herb Stone in this book because I don't think people understand just how in influential he was to me and um yeah i mean it it'll be fun it's it's therapeutic bro it's not like i'm doing like world research and i have to read like it's this is my life so i mean it's it's very easy i sit down and just think about things that's awesome that well that well well, i'll be looking forward to that i'm sure a lot of people in the boxing uh boxing world will i mean it seems uh very semi-autobiographical as well as it will be well, it will historical. be. Uh, Can I ask you a question? Was the sure. book good? Was the I, book good? Did you enjoy it? Like I did. Was it I did. It was. It, you know, the thing that I like about it now that you're explaining it, it's it's very uh, accessible to everybody. So, you, like you said, you know, boxers might not have you know the uh, you know, college degree or whatnot, but so it really kind of puts it plain and simple as to what to do. Uh, starting out and kind of goes into your experiences as far as uh, you know uh, what you've seen in in, uh, in uh, your uh, travels as far as going to you know uh, going to gyms uh, hanging out with boxers going to fights things like that so I thought that that was 
uh, that input was very, very good. And also just more uh, of, of a kind of a historical perspective. I mean, maybe not historical because we're not talking about dates and, you know, certain facts and things like that, but more of a, more of a, this is how, how this, this sport is, and this is how, what you should be, uh, taking into account. So I, I, I greatly appreciate uh, uh, that, uh, that aspect. It was, like I said, it was a very easy read. It wasn't one of those dense things like perhaps my book is where you have to kind of think about like all the legal terms and stuff like that. So I really enjoyed it. And it can't, I mean, like the one thing I did, uh, did like when you got into kind of your own personal narrative about, you know, hanging out after a fight or, or, you know, was watching a fighter in a gym. I thought those, those were, were cool spots as well. So uh, definitely be looking for that in Outside the Ropes. Yeah, I mean, and I got to send me the link to your book. I didn't know you had one, so I got to buy that one. I will send you the book. All... Here, I'll show, I'll show no, you. No, 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 I don't, I don't do that stuff, bro. You, you can gonna... send me a book, but I'm still going to buy a book. See, there it is. I... See, this is why I don't, this is, they had to do the stock photo. So I definitely, yeah, I will give me your, uh, the, end, the next book that we'll I will trade, do. we'll trade books, but I'm yeah. still going to buy. No, I, I bought yours on, I, I bought yours on online. So I, that's why I can't show you the actual physical book because I just, I, I was just reading it on my iPad. So my favorite thing is like, there's, I like to read a lot. And one of my favorite books was a book I read in school called leadership without easy answers by Ronald Heifetz. And I think that I haven't brought that up to that. That's one of the like that's another key focus of this book is like oftentimes in life or it, when you choose a profession or you choose a passion, you're, you're going to think the answers are obvious, but each answer has consequence. Each decision has consequence and you have to think through those. And just a lot of, at least to me at life where I'm at in life, and maybe I'm still young enough, quote unquote, young enough to be at this point is a lot of the, the success to life is standing behind your decision and believing it's right and having the framework of those around you saying it's right. Now there are outliers where there's a guy like Mussolini where it's like, he thinks he's doing things right. And it's like, everyone's going along with it, but he's actually doing a lot of really wrong things. But I think that if you have a solid moral compass, the character is there and you really try to look at empathy and view what is this situation. That's how you have the highest possible level of success. I just think that for us as MMA and boxing fans, the harsh reality is not everybody can be that superstar, but they all aim to be the superstar. And the hard part is how do you get someone to maximize their talent? And are they willing to be okay that their, their maximum in this life that they were given might not be what they had hoped for? Yeah. Well said. Well said. So um, I wanted to get, before I let you go, I wanted to get uh, kind of your input on the fall boxing schedule. Uh, we got some, uh, you tell me what's an interest, I mean, what's an interesting boxing matchup uh, that we are going to see before the end of the year? Uh-oh. Oh, what happened? me a second my computer went crazy but oh. i got you so um i heard the exact question so i will okay. jump in uh i mean i'm so hard at these this is like weird because like i'm so in ingrained in boxing like i'd rather watch a movie or play golf or do a so like there's not a lot of fights where i'm like oh man the fight's on and i that gets a lot of boxing fans upset because it's like it's not as much my passion it's something that i care about though I think that fights for fans that want to see some great fights. If you like women's boxing, there's a great card October 15th, which is next week. Pleasure That's speech. Savannah Marshall, Clarissa Shields. That's Alicia Baumgartner versus Michaela Mayer. That's a very interesting fight. Devin Haney is going to be rematching Cambosis. I think what's interesting about that is Vasil Lomachenko will fight Jermaine Ortiz, an undefeated fighter. Let's say Haney and Lomachenko win those fights, which are no guarantees. That might put them on a collision course to fight in the following year. Uh, we got Deontay Wilder coming back. That's an, kind of an interesting thing. I think the Dimitri Bivol versus Zordo Ramirez is an absolutely fantastic fight. So those are some of like the fights I'm circling. I also really like this youngster, uh, Charlie Sheehy. He's returning November 12th on the Genebec card. 
Sinise Estrada will be on that card. Um, that's a good one. And I think we're all kind of, as fight fans, we're waiting to see what the late November, December schedule will be. Teofimo Lopez has the date for the night of the Heisman that ESPN is giving top rank. We're kind of assuming it's Pedraza, but we're sitting around seeing what that card will be. So I think those are kind of the fights that if you don't really follow boxing week in, week out, those are some good ones to just be aware of. And if you hear that that fight's happening and you have nothing to do, maybe check it out. Okay, so two things before I let you go. My Zoom runs out. First thing, uh, will we see Spence Crawford? Ever? Uh, in the next year. I don't know. I don't know. I, I mean, there's two ways of thinking of it. It should happen, but then there's a part of me that like Spence is a little bit more powerful. And like my book talks about, boxing is more about political capital and who holds more political capital. It's not a business because we never see business people come into boxing. Like we don't see Elon Musk going, what's a great financial investment? Let's go to boxing. This is such a thriving business. It's political capital, right? It's who... It's closer to politics. It's closer to what Lyndon B. Johnson was doing when he was the master of the Senate than it is what Warren Buffett did to make his millions. That's the honest truth. So if you look at it from a political capital standpoint, I'm very cynical because I feel like Errol Spence has more years to wait to make this fight, whereas Crawford doesn't. As a fan of the sport, I hope it happens because if it doesn't happen within the next year, these fighters aren't famous enough and aren't big enough stars for this fight to Maronite like uh, Mayweather yeah, yeah, Pacquiao. Yeah. And it's actually going to hurt both of their legacies and the sport in general. Last question. What do you think of Jake Paul? I'm, I'm fine with the overall nature of what Jake Paul is doing in terms of bringing awareness to the sports uh, and sport. I don't know why I pluraled that. I guess I got a little country for you. I'm fine with that because he's taking on good opponents for his skill set and he's kind of jumping in. He did open the door for influencer boxing, which feels like someone's going to get really hurt and that's going to be scary. I do think that he's pushing himself to the limit and he's living the life. My only one concern about Jake Paul is I'm a little curious about uh, drug drug testing around his fights. If he's going to go into world rankings I would like him to be in an accredited uh, drug there to be accredited drug testing of some fashion. If he goes into the WBC system, that would be great because they have that clean boxer program. But my only concern is moving forward, I, especially with this Connor Ben situation. If a fighter is a world ranked uh, world championship level boxer, there should be a form of drug testing at times for that fighter to make sure we're in a safe sport. So after this Anderson Silva fight, if he were to win, I'd like to see drug testing moving forward for some of his next fights. Not that I'm accusing him of it. I'm just saying that's what's next for me is I'd like to see him pass that threshold. But I think Jake Paul is a net good for the sport of boxing because he's coming at the sport with refreshing new opinions. And he's kind of doing what Dana White did to boxing 10 to 15 years ago by making Dana White look old and out of date. He's kind of saying the same things Dana White did where... <laughs> where he was like, MMA is making all the fights. And now he's basically like, this is boxing versus MMA. And I'm beating these MMA guys. And like Dana White doesn't have an argument besides yelling. And it's like that worked 13 years ago when he was a vibrant younger person. Now that he's a, a multimillionaire that's done it for 15 years, Jake's young enthusiasm seems to be winning those arguments. Uncle Lukey, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I greatly appreciate it. Once again, get the book. It's on Amazon. Uh, anywhere else is that we can uh, we, uh, get your book, Inside the Ropes? Uh, I mean, just Amazon because, like, if you, you buy everything on Amazon. Don't act like you don't buy everything on Amazon. If you think of something, where you go, you go to Amazon. So if you if you live in Northern California, I got about 100 of these suckers. And I'm hitting the road too. Um, a road show, excellent. I'm hit. Well, I mean, we're doing some book signs, but I mean, I'm on the road. You know, I like to travel. So if I'm coming to your city, just let me know. And 
Uh, Jason, I deeply respect you so much. I, am I allowed to say by government name? I always forget if I'm allowed to say. Yeah, that, that's so, fine. No, you can. Use okay. <laughs> Sometimes guys go, "Oh, my name's Knockout Guy," and like <laughs> I say their name, and they're like, "Oh, why are you saying?" Um, I deeply respect you. Uh, I'm a fan of what you do, and it's an honor to be on your show because uh, you you do really good work. And I, I the thing beyond doing really good work, and I took off my championship Super Bowl ring is. What I see about you that makes you so great is your passion for the sport. And it's it really, um, as cynical and as burnout as I get at times, seeing your passion and other people I respect's passion, that's what keeps me going. Because I get to meet people who are great people who I might not meet otherwise that truly were brought to this sport and love it. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Luki. I didn't, I, I actually didn't pay you for that. So whoever, uh, so thank you so much. Uh, we definitely will link up once again, talk about some, some more fights coming up. Uh, have a great one. My Zoom is about to run out, but this is Jason Cruz, MMA Payout. Have a good one.